So, welcome to the Jewish Assisti. Good level. Should I keep it like this, the mic? Okay, uh, welcome to the guest of honor interview with uh, one of the uh, kind of film house guest of honor, Kat Valente. Who's been uh, nominated and she has won several awards, prestigious awards, the Tip Tree and the Norton Yoga nominated, one Yoga as well. One, two. Oh, two Yogas, yes. Um, I will start with the uh, chronology at the beginning. Can you tell us a bit about uh, your childhood when you grew up? Where, where you grew up? Sure. Uh, I usually say that um, I grew up on the West Coast of America because it's easier than explaining that I lived in the, all the S cities, starting from Seattle down to uh, San Francisco and Sacramento. Uh, my parents were divorced about 30 seconds after I was born, so I went back and forth between my dad uh, up in Seattle and my mom in Sacramento and then the Bay Area. Uh, and she was in her graduate program for most of my youth, so that was why we shifted to the Bay Area where she got a teaching position. Um, so I traveled a lot, even, even as a child. Um, and then I went to college uh, at UC San Diego, so again with the S cities, keep moving south and more S's. Um, and uh, in my last year, I transferred to Edinburgh University in Scotland, still with the S's. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I graduated there. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I had a, your typical American broken home childhood. And uh, I, I spent a lot of time by myself uh, imagining better lives. I think that was sort of how I started to hear the stories. Um, you, you, you moved around more than, I mean, after, after growing up, you yeah. moved around a bit. Which is your favorite place? Which was your favorite place to live in? Edinburgh, no contest. Um, I absolutely loved it. I would move back in a heartbeat. Uh, it, it's just such an extraordinary city and a city of contrast. And I really like the cold. Uh, so it, it was perfect, the cold and the dark, it was perfect for me. Um, but yeah, I moved a lot, around a lot even after that. My first husband, my, my former life was a naval officer's wife. Uh, and so we moved around quite a bit. Uh, I lived in Japan for a number of years, which is where I first started publishing. Uh, and I've lived in just about every region of the US as well. Okay. I think I've read somewhere that the average American moves uh, interstate seven times hmm. during the life. I mean, among, among my friends and family, I'm quite unusual. My, all my siblings pretty much live within 50 miles of where we grew up, but most people I know stay. Growing up, I mean, many children create fictional worlds. Uh, I mean, complete countries or imagine. Did you do that? You know, not really. I, uh, I was always sort of focused on the story rather than the world. So I was constantly, I've seen video actually uh, of me at about three years old babbling on uh, on a hiking trip about the wizard who lives under the mountain. Mm -hmm. My parents are absolutely not listening to me at all. But they're going, uh-huh, that's nice. Okay, sweetie. As I'm like spinning this, this story. Um, but I was always thinking of stories. I was always uh, saying them out loud and writing poetry and all of that. But um, I, I feel like in my head, all the stories took place in the same world, but I didn't need to make it because it was just the world inside my head. Uh, and I just lived there. So it wasn't until much, much later that I started sort of consciously building worlds like that. Um, I, I wrote poetry for you know my entire young life. I didn't even try writing fiction until I graduated from college. So poetry was sort of where I was at all of those years. Uh, what kind of poetry? Uh, well, <laughs> confessional poetry, I suppose, as all yeah. teenagers do. Um, I actually was really uh, committed to formal poetry for a really long time. I wrote sonnets, I wrote very strict line rhymes, and I was really very interested in that. Um, unfortunately, when you go to college in the United States, uh, your professors do not want you to do that. It, it's just not what the cool kids do as far as poetry goes. Um, and so uh, I have a series of creative writing instructors who um, had two, <laughs> two uh, models. One was, Cat is a terrible writer and will never ever be any good. And uh, two was, you have to write, you have to put your blood on the page, you have to uh, you know, go deep into your childhood trauma and like, 
not Ryan your child with Donald Trump, I just reverse it. Uh, and that was real and true. Uh, so I sort of had the Ryan poetry beaten out of me in higher education. What did you study? I mean, in senior high and uh, college? Yeah, I studied classics, um, which is Greek and Latin. Uh, so again, with the strict structure, I've yeah. always been uh, really drawn to that. Um, I actually changed my major, though. I wasn't originally a classics major. Uh, when I was in, I don't, I don't know if you guys have the equivalent of community college here. Um, don't ask me. <laughs> uh, well, you know, in America, college is very expensive, so one of your options, if you didn't come from money, as I did not, is to go to a two-year community college where you get your basic requirements out of the way for much less money. So I did that. Um, there's quite a stigma of that not being a good education. I got a great education in community college. Uh, if you've seen the show Community, you have seen what community college is. Um, and a professor <coughs> named Catherine Holmein decided, and she was a professor at Meredith, she was retired, and she was a poetry professor. She decided she wanted to teach a year-long course that was half the year on the Iliad and half the year on the Odyssey, and that's it, nothing else. Um, and she taught it as poetry, not as history or, or anything, you know, that was a, a strict academic thing, but just the beauty of the words of the poetry. And we all completely fell in love with it. And at the end of the year, I still can't believe this is a real thing that exists, but it does. We partnered with the Sacramento Homeric Salon and the Sacramento Poetry Center, and we put on an all-night reading of the Iliad uh, from dusk till dawn. There was about 100 people out in a field in the middle of nowhere. We had a whole lamb roasting on a spit and a huge bonfire and drums. And uh, everybody was assigned different passages and given a, a number so that you could go up in order. And we had like the numbers pinned down our jeans leg. And uh, there was, Catherine had invited a man to come and read the first 15 lines of every book in ancient Greek, in Dactylic, etc. And I never heard anything like it. I just, like, my whole life changed. That was the entire reading in, 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 in Greek? In English. We were in English translation. Fagel's translation, but okay. that first 15 lines of each book were, were done by this man yes. in ancient Greek, and I, I knew that I had to change my life, and I did. And I, I went down to San Diego, and I began to learn. And the next year we did the Odyssey, and I learned the Greek. Um, and actually, these readings still happen all these years later. Catherine has done them all over the world, yeah. from Crete to New York and everywhere in between. So it, it's still a thing 20 years later. Fantastic. Um, so, when we, I mean, you were studying classics, Greek, Latin, what, what plans did you have for, for life? Or was it just because it was fun? No, um, so my mother was a political science professor. So um, the way that my odd little brain worked was that I loved writing, but obviously I'm never going to make a living writing, so I need to have a safe backup plan, so I'll be an academic, which is just as competitive and, and unlikely to succeed as writing is. But because I grew up around academics, I was raised by graduate students, uh, it was something I knew. So I had planned on being a classical professor. Um, and I ended up dropping out of, of my master's program to get married, and I'm not married to him anymore, so that went bad. Good job, you. <laughs> myself on the head. Um, and I, I didn't actually end up finishing uh, my master's degree, but, but yeah, that was my plan, uh, was to be an academic, and maybe I would write a book slowly over 15 years on the side. Okay, but you dropped it because you got married, and it's because it wasn't the name that you had to drop it, otherwise you Yes. Conceded the Air Force and continued. Yeah, uh, it was because he was in the Navy and this was during the first Iraq War, so he was being deployed. Oh, yeah. He got married. I mean, look, this is a story that is so cliche that, uh, you know, dragons and elves actually seem like revolutionary compared to how cliche the story of my first marriage is. But, uh, no, I, we got married too young, too soon. He went to war immediately and I didn't see him for two years, and it turns out that that's not good. For <laughs> <laughs> you should not. Uh, what do you think? Do you, I mean, when you grow up, do you think there are any particular things that made you into a writer? I think everything made me into a writer. Um, I so my, my parents uh, actually met at UCLA Film School, and when I was very small, my mom was directing theater, and my dad was directing independent films. Like some of my earliest memories are of my mother wearing all black and going to some place called Rehearsal which seemed like a magical country to me. <laughs> and like, I, would call, I called her monologues marmalades, because marmalade was the closest word I could think of to that. And so I was, I, I was born into storytelling. Like, that was, 
the world I lived in. My mother loves to tell the story of that. When I was two years old, I came to rehearsal with them and I watched them do the play. And then I walked on stage, I grabbed a headset and said, everyone sit down, now I'm going to do a play. And I proceeded to do a one-woman show for the next half an hour, two and a half years old. Uh, so, like, I've never not been steeped in the story. Uh, and though they both went on to do more practical things with the kind of kids, uh, you know, my dad dropped us into movies head first. I never had any rules about what I could see and what I couldn't. And, yeah. uh, you know, my mom's rule seems insane now, but my mom's rule was whatever she was reading, I was reading. No yeah. time that I could read. So when I was five, she was getting her master's degree in 18th century drama. So I was reading Beaumarchais and uh, all kinds of very strange things. She used to read in Plato's Republic as a bedtime story. And then we were on to surrealist French theater. Yeah. I was allowed to swear if I swore in French. What, what did you get out of that, do you think? Because I mean, obviously, most, most of it went over your, yeah, most of it would have gone over your head, I suppose. But, but, but the thing is, well, first of all, surrealism never goes over a kid's head. The world okay. seems like an incomprehensible place to a child, so you absolutely accept what's in surrealist theater because the world is surreal. Uh, an insane imagination that made connections all over the place. And because nothing was ever considered too adult for me, uh, I never considered anything out of balance. So, the Breast of Tunisia, I don't know if any of you know this play, it's by Paul Mare. Um, it is insane. Uh, and it's actually, looking back on it, a great gender bending uh, play. It's basically the, the women of Zanzibar, because back then, uh, if a country sounded interesting, magical things must be happening there, never mind the actual human beings living in, the, in such a place. But uh, the women of Zanzibar decided they wanted to stop having children and start being astronauts and presidents, uh, and so they do. And so the men of Zanzibar start having children, but are overly competitive as men are. So each man has 47,000 and then 48,000 children, and 49,000 and 50. And it is it is a madhouse of a play. And I was obsessed with it at six years old. I could not stop reading it. The whole opening monologue is this woman yelling abuse at the audience for oppressing her because she's a woman. And then she starts taking, like, uh, toy balls and then like grenades out of her shirt and throwing them at the audience and like this is what filled my imagination as a small child in addition to good night human and Narnia and things like that and I think it, it was incredibly formative for my, for my mind. Were there any drawbacks? I mean you said it, it sounds like an insane idea and I mean, to me it sounds for a insane idea <laughs> to, to let the child read. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, if I'm lucky enough to have children, I will do the same. I don't really think that there were any drop. Oh, well, I mean, I have my friends. Uh, like the other kids at school did not want to hear about uh, the impression of women when I was six years old, <laughs> uh, or or like, having me take toys out of my shirt and throw them at them. Like they, they were not interested in that. So I, I did have a very lonely childhood. I didn't have a lot of friends or anybody I could talk to about the things I was reading. But uh, other than that. Other than being entirely socially isolated, there were no drawbacks. That might have happened anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think mean, what, what, what was your favorite reading uh, when you were I mean, in your teens? Uh, in my teens, um, you know, I, it's funny, in a lot of ways I didn't really discover classic children's literature until I was a teen because I was reading Apollinaire instead. So I had read The Lord of the Rings when I was 13, I read uh, Alice in Wonderland when I was 12. I uh, read Peter Pan when I was 14, and like those were the things I really started falling crazy in love with. And then um, I went through this Asimov phase where I just was peeling through everything that I could find by Asimov because uh, I started with his Guide to Shakespeare. That's not how most people discover Asimov. I didn't even, I didn't even know that on the oh, other hand, he was quite yeah. productive. So. Yeah, so um, I, as I said, I was living in California. Um, in Oregon, just over the border, is the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in a town called Ashland. And we went every single summer. Now, the town of Ashland exists for Shakespeare, of Shakespeare, by Shakespeare. This festival is all that happens in the town. So everything is like faux Tudor, all the streets are named after Shakespearean characters. It's Shakespeare Disneyland. And they do like five to eight plays every summer. And this was sort of the ritual of our summer. So on the drive up, which is about six hours in preparation, I was reading as a guy's mom's guide to Shakespeare and like going through each of the plays. And I was like, this guy's really, really smart. I wonder what else he's written. And the answer is literally everything. Uh, so I actually was really, in my um, sort of mid to late teens, was really into hard science fiction and more classic science fiction. Yeah. 
Uh, when, did, I mean, when did you start to think about writing fiction? Uh, <clears throat> and then you started poetry. Yeah, so the first piece of fiction I ever wrote was for an experimental writing class in my uh, junior year of college. Uh, so experimental, we were studying Kerouac and Virginia Woolf, you know, those modern uh, radicals. Um, I actually had no idea that my professor is, was very famous in uh, experimental poetry, the field at the time, in literary poetry. Her name was Ray Armand Trout. If any of you are into the language poetry movement, you would know that name, but I don't, I don't expect it. I didn't know it until later. Um, and I, I really hated living in Southern California. I was required to write a short story. I, I was never going to just write a realist story. So I ended up writing a story about um, Galahad living in Southern California and hating it and looking for the grail in uh, beachside bars in San Diego, which actually ended up becoming a chapter in an Arthurian novella I wrote called Under the Mirror much, much later. But that was the first fiction that I ever wrote. And uh, Ray was a really hard ass teacher, and she worked no fools. Uh, she had already gotten on me for my poetry being full of what she called fantasy genre cliches, which killed my soul when she said that. I was just so mortified. I think in some sense she's still on my shoulder all the time saying no fantasy genre cliches. Um, and that was, she liked that. It was the first time a writing teacher had ever liked something that I wrote, that, that story. By that time, I think that the Alvin Jones Top Guide to Fantasy Land was published. Mm, yeah, it happened. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, also, but I, good corrective. I was, I was so, I mean, I was so isolated from fandom. Though I, I was in a classics department, and I didn't. I was living in San Diego, and didn't even know about Comic Con. Okay. I, 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 I spent my entire life with my nose down in books. And I didn't really realize that there were other people doing that too, because I was so focused on the books. So I, I didn't read Top Gun: The Fantasy Land for about three years after that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I wrote that story, and then really nothing else until I graduated. And then I was living <clears throat> in Rhode Island, in a little tiny town in Rhode Island, and I was working as a fortune teller in a gothic tower. It was an actual gothic stone tower in a room used by the Rhode Island Shakespeare Festival as storage for their props. So I was actually reading tarot cards in Lear's throne with like Lloyd's skull up behind me. Um, and I heard about Nana Rima, which some of you may have heard of and participated in. Um, but this was only in the second year, actually, and it was October, and I was 22, so I was full of piss and vinegar, and I didn't know I couldn't do things, so I said, I don't want to wait, and 30 days is for wimps, I'm going to do it in 10. So I did it. Uh, in between my, my readings, I would, like, under the velvet covered table, I would pull up my little laptop and, and, and work on a book that became The Labyrinth. Uh, it actually was my first published book, and I wrote it uh, in 10 days in Rhode Island. I had no idea how to write a book. Uh, I used to get really mad when people said that The Labyrinth was just a 200-page poem, but I'm confident and secure in my, my abilities now, and I can admit that it's a 200-page poem. I just took the part of that. I had no idea how to write a novel at all. What were you reading at the time? Uh, I mean, did you have any... who, who inspired you? Well, I think, that that if I, tell, I think if I tell you what my username on the Nanorimo forums are, you might uh, get it. So I was Desolation Angel on the uh, uh, Nanorimo forums, and Desolation Angels is a Jack Kerouac book. I loathe On the Road, but love all of Kerouac's other work. Um, and so I was reading uh, Anais Smith, I was reading Henry Miller, I was reading Jack Kerouac, um, and I was still, I was working on my still unfinished translation of Antigone, so I was still reading a lot of Greek. And I think a lot of that early style that people have commented on, it had a lot to do with me having three languages bouncing around my head at the same time. And the syntax of Latin and Greek is very different than English syntax. And I still have trouble with passive voice construction because that's not a problem in Greek and Latin. That's a normal construction, but it's not considered correct in English. Um, and so I, I came at writing that book from just this chaotic explosion of, of languages and reading and sort of pulling my badger notes up from classics and, uh, and reading. Oh, and John Barth, I was reading John Barth at the time a bit, uh, and noticing how many of these realist writers were writing about mythology and folklore, mm -hmm. but somehow they were getting away with not being called fantasy writers, even though they were writing about Helen of Troy and Minotaurs and things like that, which seemed grossly unfair to me. 
I, I just have to ask, how did you end up being a fortune teller? <laughs> so uh, my mom taught me when I was 10 years old to read tarot cards, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I mean, there's nothing not for a 10-year-old in tarot cards. The pictures are amazing. You can tell the future. Like, it, it's, it's just magical. But I actually think the best training I ever had for becoming a writer was the month I spent working as, uh, as a fortune teller, because you're telling a story. You are telling a flash fiction story in 15 minutes. You are looking at a person that comes in, you are deciding who they are as a character based on the whole, how they walk, what they're wearing, is there a wedding ring, how they talk, all of those things. And then I always tried to demystify the process a little bit. I would tell them exactly what I was doing, like okay. exactly what each position meant, what the cards meant. Um, and I did very well. I actually, it was like six or seven years before I was making as much as a writer as I made as a fortune teller. Um, and it, you just, it, it's therapy, it's a little bit of therapy. No one ever goes to a fortune teller to find out something they didn't already know. They want to know that they already made the right choice. That's all anyone wants to know. Uh, so you learn to tell a story quickly, to be confident with your voice, to be, to create an emotional moment for an audience of one. And it was incredible training. You obviously write very fast. I think you've commented on that uh, elsewhere as well. Uh, but you, I think you also said that you spend a lot of time in your preparations. Mm. Uh, what kind of preparations? Well, I, I do, it, it is funny because I am a fast and slow writer. The actual writing I do very quickly, but the planning often takes years. Uh, Radiance, a, it's a novel, my science fiction novel that came out in October. Um, I wrote the short story that became Radiance in 2008, but the book didn't come out until 2015, and I didn't really start writing it until 2013. And I wrote the book in, I guess, if you add up sort of all of the time, I probably wrote it four or five months. Um, more like four. But I had spent all of that time just sort of thinking about it and letting those characters sit with me and imagining it. And in many ways, Radiance is the most ambitious book I've ever written, and I, I wasn't a good enough writer in 2008 to pull off what I wanted to pull off. Um, but the thing is that my preparation, I think, is not like a lot of people's preparation. When I say I'm thinking about it, I'm not planning it, uh, I'm not like working on the structure, I'm asking like human resources questions. Like, if my book were a tree, what kind of tree would it be? And weird things like that, and, like what color is the book? And it's, it sounds so bizarre, but like these are, I'm kind of synesthetic, and, like these, these are the things yeah. that sort of happen as a book is, coming up in my mind. And I have, uh, some of it is research. I've been writing a lot of historical fiction over the last couple of years, and, and some of that comes with just a tremendous uh, amount of reading and research. But I do spend a lot of time thinking and planning um, before I ever sit down to, to type a single word. So it, it is somewhat deceptive. Um, you know, I've, I wrote Palimpsest in 30 days. I, 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 didn't, I kept that Nana Rimo thing, actually, for a long time, because it was really helpful to me to have uh, a deadline like that before I had deadlines that were from editors. Mm -hmm. um, it was really helpful to keep it all in one sort of go because I could I managed I could manage to like believe that I was good at writing and the book was worthy and like it was still a good idea and it was all gonna happen. I could manage to keep that belief in myself up for about 30 days before it all just went to the birds. So uh, I did that for a long time. I wrote Palm Test in 30 days and I uh, I wrote Deathless in 45. Uh, and uh, it, it took me two months to write Fairyland, the first Fairyland book. But all that is very deceptive. The only one of those that really was from like beginning to end was Fairyland because I never intended to write Fairyland as a full-length novel. So sure, I had that idea, but I never thought about it before I was suddenly mm -hmm. doing it as a serial novel online. Um, so that really was planning plus execution all in two months. But I do write quickly. Um, one might call it a predictable outcome that I've developed really severe carpal tunnel over the last couple of years, so I've had to slow down a little bit. Uh, when you do research, how much of the original idea survives the original research team? Um, a lot, actually. Uh, I mean, I love doing research. I'm a, I'm a lapsed academic, so research is, is some of the most fun uh, I can have with writing to me. Uh, so, I mean, usually the, if, if I 
I have ideas for novels that, ne that I never write all the time. If the idea is strong enough that I've begun the research process, it's usually going to hold up. Um, like, you know, if, if things may be added to it, um, there may be some nugget I find in the research that becomes an important plot point. But that core idea of the novel, if I've gotten far enough to be buying books and, and spending time in libraries, then it's, it's pretty solid in there. Um. We have been looking at your books. They are a more than they're more than most books. I uh, would say they are a sort of mixture of real ideas, characters, thoughts, and uh, language. I mean, your, the, the actual language figures very prominently. Do you find it difficult to juggle these elements? Um, I mean, as I said, I started out as a poet, so I can't help with how much I care about language. I do deeply care about it. Um, I don't find it difficult to juggle language with anything else because I think that all writers have certain superpowers and then other things are really difficult. Um, I write fast, that's one of mine, I'm like the flash. <laughs> I can go really quickly and I can do language easily. Like people ask like how I do that language. I don't. That's how the inside of my head works. It's not what comes out of my mouth because uh, I speak very casually. But it's, it's just how my thoughts are organized. I don't have to expend very much effort to do that language. Um, Plot remains difficult for me. Uh, I spent a lot of time, it was really easier when I didn't care about plot. Writing was, was a lot easier before. I felt like that was an important aspect of it. And now I spend a lot of time sort of puzzling out plot. And I think of it as a puzzle, uh, where you know, like one of those thousand piece puzzles where it's mostly blue sky. Like, yes, there are many pieces that color-wise would fit here, but they don't actually, you know, there's some tiny little millimeter that's, that's different. Um, so that, that remains very difficult for me. Um, and, I mean, I, I, I love creating characters, and I, I love a, a deep focus on a single character. In some sense, all of my short stories are monologues that are just not performed on stage. Um, and my theatrical background, and I grew up acting, I think I said that when I was talking about theater, but for another couple of years, I still have spent longer being an actress in my life than I have being a writer. Um, but I do still find it hard to struggle that deep focus on, on a lot of different characters. Uh, I am much more comfortable with um, something like Six Guns Snow White, which is very focused on a single voice and a single protagonist. Um, so, I'm, I mean, I don't think anybody ever stops learning how to write a book. I, you know, I've heard it attributed to both Lil Gaiman and Stephen King that uh, you never learn how to write a book, you only learn to write this book. And I have no idea which one of them said it, or indeed, maybe it was Oscar Wilde. <laughs> so Albert Einstein. Or Albert Einstein. And do you write linearly from the beginning yes. on page one to mm -hmm. in the radiance? Yeah, um, because radiance brings space. <laughs> um, generally speaking, yes, I write from A to Z. Uh, I, if I skip a part because I didn't want to write it that day, I will never ever go back and write that part. I just, I have ADD, I don't, I can't do that. So uh, I write as a reader progresses through the book. Radiance is, it was actually such an aberration in terms of my writing process. Um, I, like I said, I had the idea and I uh, sat with it for such a long time and I honestly, it was so big, it was so huge in my head, I didn't know how to get it all on the page without having a hundred pages of, you know, preamble about the world. And so it took a long time for me to find a way into it. And I turned in, uh, I turned in the book in, 2013, it's my editor, and I knew it was a mess. I knew it was not right, but it needed to be turned in, and I knew that I could fix it in editing. Uh, and that editing process, the book became twice as long. Uh, all of it, like, just massive amounts were added to it, uh, and I actually finally did the thing with the index cards on the wall of, of piecing out the structure. It's like, it, People have said it's a chaotic structure. It is not. It is actually mathematical. Each each. I was I was starting on my own index cards, <laughs> reading it just, just to, to keep track of who did what, when, with whom. And there's a timeline in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so radiance is actually really different from my usual writing process. I can't really draw any conclusions from it unless the next book comes out the same way. God, I hope not. <laughs> Do you have any sort of stuck in way in your head, any ideas of, of a novel that you feel that you're not skilled yet to write? Um, Saving up, so to speak, or yeah, you have all the tools? Uh, I have a book that I, you know, God, has it really been that long? It's probably been a 
probably been nine years since I, gross, it was wrong with me, um, since I had the idea for it. And I have you know, like 10,000 words of it written and I haven't really been working on it. Uh, it's called The Year of Red Snow. Um, some of you may or may not know that uh, in the early 1800s there was a, a year of, uh, the year without a summer. Yeah, yeah. Volcanic explosion and in Indonesia, and uh, there was just chaotic weather conditions, and like horses died in the streets. And, and uh, as I was reading about this for an entirely different book, uh, I came across just a little line that in some villages in southern Hungary and northern Italy, red snow fell throughout the year. So I have this sort of traditional magical realist kind of novel that. I will at some point write, but I, I just, again, kind of like radio, like I, I'm not sure how to fully get into it without just face planting into the cliches of magical realism, which I don't want to do. Apart from radio, I suppose that what you've written, I mean, at least recently, in the last 10 years or so, has been based on folk tales, fairy tales, myth. But I mean, you, you said you read a lot of hard SF in your tunes. Yeah. Um, so, will you be writing more essay? And then why, why has it been so much myth, fairy tale? Um, I mean, I grew up with myths and fairy tales. You know, in addition to the surrealist French theater, my mom would always just buy any fairy tales from around the world collection she saw. I have so many of them. Um, I grew up with fairy tales and folk tales and mythology. Uh, they were a total passion of mine from very early on in life. And I, I believe in them. They, they are part of what moves us through this world. We wouldn't still be telling these fairy tales to kids if, if, if they weren't part of the truth of living on planet Earth. Um, and I think that they can say extraordinarily powerful things. And because, uh, because so many of us grew up, if not with the same fairy tales, with the same patterns of fairy tales, uh, you can access kind of a child's hind brain, even in adults, and say things you wouldn't be able to Otherwise, so I, I mean, I love writing fairy, fairy tales and folk tales. I have written other things. Alex is not uh, a fairy tale or folk tale. And, um, I've written a number of novellas, like um, Silently and Very Fast, which is, it does have fairy tale elements, but it's not based on them. Um, I love writing science fiction. It's, it's much more difficult for me than writing fantasy. Like, all of these things I've been saying, I don't have to do extra research to write a, a mythologically based, folklore based book. It's all there. I can just write. For science fiction, I have to do a tremendous amount of research because I didn't get a degree in, in any kind of science. And uh, though I'm an intelligent person who can uh, acquire and collate information easily, it's it's not something I've spent my entire life studying. Mm -hmm. So um, I have to like every paragraph requires looking things up and studying it and trying to understand it. Suddenly, very fast, I had the idea for for a long time. But I refused to start writing it until I had taken some programming lessons and had some kind of understanding of what it, it might take to actually program an AI, which I think was invaluable for writing that book and for being able to imagine it. It's hard SF, I promise. There's some cutting edge stuff about genetic programming in that book. Um, I just put some pretty adjectives on it, that's all. It doesn't make it not hard SF. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, I would love to write more science fiction, um, and I'm, I'm sure that I will. Uh, it, every time that I come across some new advancement in technology that uh, sets off something in my mind, like stories tend to come from it. Um, but but I, I mean, my interest in science fiction, I don't really necessarily have very much interest in near future science fiction. Um, I, I still like it to be a little bit more epic and far flung. Uh, so I, I have that balance between being, being very interested in the actual science of it and like in radiance, uh, you know, a love of that older science fiction of the pulp planets and yeah. things like that. I mean, there's so much in radio. I mean, it's, it's all history, it's uh, uh, bizarre creatures, uh, it's just a steampunky feeling. What, 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 I mean, what gave you an idea? What's art? What's the, the spark of life? So, of I read an interview by Mark Danielewski, who wrote House of Leaves. Some of you may have read House of Leaves, one of my favorite books. Um, and he was talking about how his father was a cinematographer and it had this huge effect on him as a writer, as a, in his style, and in the way that he saw the world. And I thought, huh, my dad was a filmmaker and I, I've never written about that. I've never uh, even particularly thought about it in connection to my work, even though my father's gaze through the camera is a huge, huge part of my life. Um, 
And at the same time, I had been sort of in the back of my mind thinking about like Zelazny's water world, Venus, and and uh, and all of that sort of thing, and how much I loved those planets before we knew those planets couldn't exist, couldn't possibly exist. I mean, Zelazny did, but like back into uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs and before uh, we had photos proving that there were no canals on Mars or anything like that. Um, and so I just sort of, those, those two ideas went in my mind and sort of combined. Uh, and so I wrote this short story for Clark's World uh, magazine. And the minute, oh, like two, I don't even think I was done writing epigraph before I knew it was already sort of fractally growing in my mind into something um, much, much bigger. And uh, so, I mean, in some sense, reading is an incredibly personal novel because it, it is very much about growing up the daughter of a filmmaker. And, like, because my dad was frustrated with his ambitions, uh, I have beautifully made home videos. Everyone these days has a childhood that is recorded. Mine was directed and edited gorgeously, <laughs> shot, and had like light readers. Um, I was just like in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, it's, it's all like in the book. I was showing uh, a few home videos to my boyfriend, and he was watching it as uh, we're up by Mount Rainier in Seattle and walk, like the, my stepmother and my dad and me are walking into the sunset. And my boyfriend said, uh, did you have to come back for the camera? And I was like, uh, well, yeah, obviously. Uh, Dad set up the camera and then we got the shot and then he went back to pick up the camera. <laughs> he was like, huh, uh, did that happen a lot? I was like, yeah, did, did you not do that? Uh, and the, the whole thing in radio is about the issue of Christmas morning. That actually happened. Like, we couldn't go down until Dad had the camera set up, until the lighting was set up. And at least once I remember uh, having to, like, like doing a second take of coming down the stairs. Uh, and it never occurred to me that that was weird. It never occurred to me because that was just... I'm not sure whether it's, it's bizarre, horrible, or just fantastic. I mean, I to me, it's just normal. Like, obviously, uh, like, you know, you're going to remember what's on camera, not what actually happened. So why not get it right, obviously. Uh, <laughs> um, and now, uh, Dad and I have so many conversations the book, and uh, he, he's read everything that I've written, my dad, and uh, he, but he loves, he loves Radiance. For Christmas, he had wedding goblets made for the two main characters of Radiance. My dad doesn't know the word fan art, but he made some. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an actual, just like fanfic. Yeah, I mean, it's that an actual thing. Thing. <laughs> uh, if, um, Over to more recent times, or our Radiance is recent, of course, more recent than most of them. But uh, the Fahrenheit, you just finished the Fahrenheit series, or just uh, yeah. published it. Yeah. Does this mean that you are finished writing for kids? Oh god, no. No, uh, uh, my next middle grade book is due in three weeks, so... Uh, okay. No, Fahrenheit, of course, was just such an unexpected thing in my life and, and my career. And I still can't really believe that it's over. I cry for about two hours after I put the last sentence onto the last book. Um, and I'm, I mean, look, I'll probably go back and write more fairy at some point. Yeah. I'd like to do a short story collection of just in world stories that sort of down the road kind of fairy land. But no, uh, so my next middle grade book is called The Lords of Glass Town. It'll come out in 2017. Um, and it's basically the Bronte children go to Narnia. Uh, some of you may know that when they were kids, Charlotte and Emily Bronte, as well as their siblings, Anne and Randall, uh, had kind of a shared world steampunk MMO, really. Uh, they wrote this fantasy world together uh, as a communal sort of exercise. And it's incredibly meta and sort of postmodern. They had in-world zines, like magazines, that, the, that people in their characters had published. Uh, and it's, it's very much the sort of child's idea of British politics and Yorkshire fairy tales and uh, you know the things that they were reading in you know, the equivalent of National Geographic magazine. So the idea of the book is that this is a real place that they, they went to and came back from. So that will be out uh, next year. Mm -hmm. No, I'll always write for kids. Um, I, I, it's funny because when I'm at conventions that are focused on YA and middle grade writing, um, they always sort of act like my writing for adults is cute, but neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. And when I'm at conventions that sort of focus on adult writing, you know, my children's writing is, well, is not, you know, Cute, but, but you know, a separate sort of thing. But I, I love doing both of them, and I would never want to give either one of them up. My guess is that most people here who have read, who have read the third book books. Uh, I, I, uh, yeah. uh, I was going to ask, uh, yeah, we, we, 
you still write poetry? Sorry? Do you still write poetry? Uh, yes, not nearly as often. Um, so I used to write quite a bit. I've had I published five collections of poetry. And then um, several years ago, I sort of stopped deliberately. I decided that um, until I really knew what the difference was between the poems I was writing and the prose I was writing, I didn't want to write any more poetry. I just, I, I just felt like I, I was sort of doing the same thing in both poetry and prose, and, and until I had a more solid handle on, on the difference, I, I was just going to focus on prose. And then two years went by, and uh, a woman named Rose Lumber, who runs a poetry zine called Stone Telling, um, started harassing me for a poem, which it took her a long time to convince me to write a poem for Stone Telling. And I, um, I finally did. It was called The Secret of Being a Cowboy. And I had so much fun writing it, not only because I sort of finally figured out a new style for writing poetry that made sense to me and was different than prose, but because I'd never written a Western before, and it was a Western poem. And that's how Six Guns No White happened. Oh, yeah. Because I wanted to write another Western, uh, as I had so much fun doing that. And I, I sort of had a spat of writing poetry after that. Um, what the Dragon Said, a love story that was on Tor.com. A lot of people read that. Um, and so I do still, from time to time, basically when I'm invited to write poetry, I, I will write poetry. <laughs> Um, I do still love it. It is still a great love of mine. Um, but uh, like the novels loom so big in my mind, it takes up so much of my imagination. And uh, you know, honestly, like most of my books have some little bit of poetry or song in them, so I still do that. Um, you could. I mean, the, the, back to crowdfunding. The, uh, the origin of the Fairgrounds books um, was it. How, how was it different? How different was it to to do a crowdfunded episodical uh, for your time? Well, so the, for those of you who have not heard this story, the story, the way that Fairyland came about was deeply strange. I wrote this book called Palimpsest, which, when I'm at school and I tell the story, I say you're not allowed to read it until you're 18, since it's adult with a capital A or a capital X. It's my big book of sex. Uh, and the, the protagonist of that book, her favorite novel from when she was a little girl is the girl who sort of navigated Fairyland in a ship of her own making. It was just a motif in, uh, in, in that book, and the, the first little paragraph, which is intact to the actual novel, uh, is in there, and the title, which was kind of a joke about like the long, gnarly titles that uh, children's literature sometimes had in the early 20th century, a joke only I find funny. Um, and I thought nothing more of it. But when we were touring for Palimpsest. People kept asking me where they could get a copy of that book. Now they can be forgiven a bit because we did an alternate reality game to promote Palimpsest and we had an Amazon order page for the girl who said navigator. It was just like if you looked at the URL, it was still on the website, it was just sitting from Amazon and it was always out of stock, obviously. Um, and I was like, oh no, no, it's just us postmodern kids, we do crazy things sometimes. And they said, well, when are you going to write that book? It's like, never. <laughs> Nobody would ever publish a children's book that is connected to my queer sex novel. Like, that's not going to happen. Uh, and then we got home from the tour, and it was during the 2008 crash, and my, my husband had been laid off from two jobs within six weeks of each other, and we had savings. But I mean, this is also a really cliched story now and, uh, for, for people around the world. But we had savings, and they didn't last. And we had we just moved to Maine and spent so much of my savings to, to make that move happen. And so, in order to make my rent, I was like, all right, I'll write a serial level online and just have a donation button up. And I remember being on instant message with Amal al who's a wonderful writer, and saying, oh, everyone wants to read Fairyland. They said they wanted to on the tour. And she's like, oh, gee, please write Fairyland, in all caps. And so I started posting it, um, a chapter every Monday, and I recorded myself reading it as well. Um, and I put a little donation button up that said, if you can donate something, if you think the book is worth anything, go ahead and donate. Don't if you can't or if you don't like it. Um, and it went viral within like 24 hours. And it was an incredible outpouring of support for me and for the book. And uh, it was just a sort of perfect storm. I think if I tried to do that now, it probably would happen the same way. Uh, you know, I had a lot of readers who never had anything of mine that they could share with their kids. I had a lot of traditionally published books. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people were feeling really frustrated with the economic state of yeah. the world. It was something they felt like they could help with. And Neil Gaiman was posting about it, one one was, and it was just, it was incredible. It was an incredible thing, and it saved us. It really did. Uh, and I, I was staying sort of ahead of the, the posting schedule for it. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, just sort of two weeks ahead. And shortly after, I went to a convention, and somebody asked me a question during the Q&A, and they said, you know, you can't go back and change anything. Like, how do you feel about that? And I went, oh, fuck. Because <laughs> it actually not occurred to me <laughs> that that was a thing. I went, oh, well, comic book writers have been doing it forever. I'll be OK. Um, so I've been staying a little bit ahead, and my agent sold it uh, to five one friends. And it won the Andre Norton Award before it ever came out, which was surreal, entirely surreal. I couldn't believe it was nominated, but they only just changed the rules so that self-published things could be nominated. And uh, I only went to the ceremony because part of the sweetening the pot for nominees was we all got to have VIP seats to see a space shuttle launch. So I was like, I'm, I'm going to wear a pretty dress and see the spaceship. That's what I'm going for. I was up against Scott Westerfeld and John Scalzi, like, you know, I wasn't going to win, but I did. And uh, I didn't even write a speech. It was, I just sort of stood up there and cried. <laughs> uh, and it, you know, Fairyland debuted on the Up Times Coast, and it was this, it still is this incredible end of imagining in my life. Final question, because we are out of time here. It's a stop there. I, that, that's finished. It means final question here. Okay. Uh, and what do you have on your bucket list as a writer? Oh, my what God. would you love to do? I mean, maybe to career-wise, yeah. writing-wise. Everything I haven't done. I would love to write a graphic novel. I'd love to work on a video game. Uh, I'm, I, I would love to see something adapted to the screen in some form or another, but I don't have any control over that. That can't be on my bucket list. I want to write a proper murder mystery. Like, yeah. There's, I have all kinds of things that I, I want to do. Um, but yeah, I would really love to be able to do graphic novel, video game, kind of more uh, stuff chatting and a little bit. Thank you. Thank you.